Well, hello again after a two week break and the lectionary is, the gospel is still in John chapter 6, which is a very long chapter, the Bread of Life chapter. We're right near the end of it. This week we're reading John 6, verses 56 to 69. And, and this picks up in the middle of Jesus saying something because as usual the lectionary has a very strange idea about how it divides up the verses so Jesus said whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father so the one who feeds on me will live because of me this is the bread that came down from heaven your ancestors ate manna and died but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever he said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum on hearing it many of his disciples said this is a hard teaching who can accept it Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him he went on to say this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the father has enabled them from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him you do not want to leave too, do you, Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Sometimes you must clear things away before you can begin a task. Perhaps you go to the kitchen to make a snack, only to find another family member has left unwashed frying pans and dirty chopping boards in the space you need. Or maybe you need to get over certain obstacles. You may be out for a walk in the woods, but your path is blocked by fallen trees. You need to clamber over them or find a way around them. And I think we have some clearing away to do if we are to get at the meaning of this week's passage. Many Christians hear Jesus' reference to eating his flesh and drinking his blood and assume that this is elaborate teaching about Holy Communion. Now I want to explain why I think that's wrong so that we can then get to what I think these verses are really about. So we need to make a few observations as we clear the ground. One is this. If you think this is about communion, how come that while there's plenty of reference to bread, there's absolutely no reference to wine? A second is that really the bread and the bread of life is tied more in the passage to Jesus and his word. It's more word than sacrament. And a third observation is that John's Gospel has no reference in it to the institution of the Lord's Supper. You know, you know from the other Gospels how he instituted it at that meal he had on the night when he was betrayed. But when John talks about that meal, what he describes is not the Lord's Supper, but Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Now some then say, well, 
John put this passage in, this bread of life passage in, instead. But that, of course, is to make a, an assumption that John has to say something about communion. Why? We're reading something back in because of our prior views when we say that. In fact, one thing that's noticeable is that while Matthew, Mark and Luke tie the Passover that was happening to um, the Last Supper in, the, in Holy Week, John ties the Passover, which foreshadows Holy Communion, to Jesus' death. Now, don't get me about different dates of Passovers, we can talk about that another time, but just see that that's where John's emphasis is. It's on the death, not on the supper. And, and I think the plain meaning, then, is that John doesn't teach about the Lord's Supper at all. At most, he assumes that his readers are familiar with one of the other Gospels, probably Mark, and he doesn't need to repeat it. So that's my little bit of clearing away to say that I have reasons to believe that this passage, this chapter, is not about Holy Communion. But then what is it about? Well, even when we get to that point, we may, may still have to begin by dealing with a misunderstanding, just as I think we've been talking about some misunderstandings. Is it possible that some of Jesus' hearers took him so literally that they thought he was talking about cannibalism? Well, it's possible. But I have to say there's no accounting for stupidity because it only takes a moment to reflect on how unlikely it would be that one person's body could feed everyone, even if cannibalism wasn't revolting anyway. Perhaps if it is a misunderstanding that the crowd get into, perhaps it's more of a deliberate misunderstanding, because what Jesus seems to be talking about is a total commitment to him to ingest him to take on his words as being full of the spirit and life means he is calling his disciples to go all in on following him now the problem comes in this form as an old saying puts it jesus is a capitalist he only believes in takeover bids and many of us are not up for being taken over by him we'd like a nice friendly relationship with jesus but we don't really want to take over and i believe it's something like that which leads to many of the disciples grumbling and walking away from him at this point So what should Jesus do? I think many of us would suggest that he should offer these disgruntled disciples a compromise, just as we might tell a husband and a wife to compromise when they're having an argument. On, on that basis, when Jesus told the rich young ruler to sell all his possessions and give the proceeds to the poor, we would have said to that wealthy man, don't walk away. Perhaps there's a certain percentage you'd agree to. But you see, the whole problem is the relationship between Jesus and the disciples is not a relationship of equals as something like a marriage is. Jesus says he is going to ascend to where he was before. In other words, to the right hand of the Father in glory. We are not his equals. I've often said that one of our problems in the church is that we want the benefits of the gospel without the responsibilities. And I think there's an element of that going on in today's reading. 
The crowd loved the feeding of the 5,000 at the beginning of the chapter, and they tracked Jesus down to this synagogue in Capernaum. But now Jesus faces them with the demands of his kingdom. You might say, the crowd wants Jesus as saviour, but not as Lord. And that's not far off in some of our attitudes at times. It's nice to have the forgiveness of sins, but really sometimes we'd rather continue on sinning and just showing up from time to time to get the forgiveness. You know, this is a critical problem for us. There are ways in which some people in our churches are very committed. Our churches as institutions couldn't run without them. You may have heard that saying that some of our churches are like football matches where 22,000 people desperately need in need of exercise watch 22 people running around who are desperately in need of a rest. But important and helpful as that commitment is to our ongoing work it's not the kind of commitment I'm talking about today because an out and out commitment to Jesus and the cause of his kingdom is what needs to come before anything else you know, we might want to take Jesus quietly aside and say, look, Jesus, haven't you learned the lessons that the politicians have? They've known for years that when their parties are led by extremists, they don't win the popular vote and they don't get into power. That's why the Labour Party elected Tony Blair and it's why in more recent years they got rid of Jeremy Corbyn. If you want influence in the world, you need to be more moderate, more middle of the road. But Jesus will never listen to advice like that. Electoral popularity is not what he's about. It's about submitting to him as Lord and seeking his kingdom. It's not about electoral popularity. Jesus knows that only a minority will take the narrow way. Our mission may be, in that popular modern expression, to make Jesus famous, but it's not necessarily to make Jesus popular. I can't help thinking of some words I used to quote in sermons many years ago. I found them in a book that really influenced me hugely as a, as a very young Christian. The book was called Sold Out and it was written by Clive Calver. And, and Calver tells this story. In 1954, a missionary in Vietnam was told by a Viet Cong guerrilla officer I would gladly die if I could advance the cause of communism one more mile. You know, as you have read to me from the Bible, I have come to believe that you Christians have a greater message than that of communism. But I believe that we are going to win the world. For Christianity means something to you, but communism means everything to us. Now, is that what Jesus is driving at in today's passage? That it's not enough for him to mean something to us, he has to mean everything. Is that why we don't make much impression on the world? Why we in the church often seem so weak and ineffective that Christianity means something to us? 
but not everything. So, will we be the disgruntled disciples who desert Jesus because he refuses to be the spiritual sugar daddy that they want? Or will we be like Simon Peter, who knows there's really no other sensible choice but to stay with Jesus when he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Or you may say, but I will mess up. I do mess up. How can I go all in with Jesus? Well, if you say that, I reply like this. Who is it I just quoted about staying with Jesus? It's Simon Peter. It's a disciple who messed up royally, but who discovered forgiveness and restoration. Just because Jesus is launching a takeover bit of our lives doesn't mean that he's withdrawn the offer of forgiveness. And I would say the same for my own life. I can think of areas where I'd rather I didn't have to yield to Jesus. And it's a battle. But my intention is to be his disciple. Any of you who know me personally will have some level of insight into my failures. But God is full of grace and mercy, working on me even if the progress seems glacially small at times. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Well, I pray that we can all say the same as Simon Peter. Amen. Thank you for joining me again. I hope, God willing, that you'll be able to watch another video next week. God bless you all. Bye-bye.